Yes. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so we have a. Um, people are loud in this town. Um, so we have been working on uh, mindfulness-based techniques um, throughout education, healthcare. But one of the focuses uh, for our office and the caucus has been uh, mental health and military mental health. So this uh, panel that we have today, I'm very excited um, to listen. Um, just a couple things that, that are, that's happening. Um, there's a program that is a training program. Uh, right now, the Marines are very, very excited about the Army. Uh, is also excited about that is a, uh, the Mind Fitness Institute is running it. It's a mindfulness-based mental fitness training. And we've had several exchanges with General Amos, um, General Dunford now, who's uh, now back in the Middle East, are very high on this uh, particular training um, because it helps the soldiers build their own resiliency. Um, and you'll hear more of this um, from, the, from the panelists, but um, almost an inoculation uh, for post-traumatic stress. That is the, the hope. And we're also seeing benefits on the backside with veterans um, with this particular program. Um, it's not necessarily designed for that, but I've talked to many soldiers who are getting trained in, in, uh, in this program, and they're starting to sleep through the nights, they're getting off their medication. A lot of very positive benefits um, with the mindfulness-based practice. There's another program called Integrative. Uh, I, know, I know it is IREST. Uh, the official name is Integrative Restoration, and it's uh, it's uh, yogic, deep yogic breathing and some meditation having very similar effects there in VAs around the country. Another uh, uh, program is called Project Welcome Home Troops, which is something very similar. A lot of deep breathing helping process a lot of the trauma that a lot of our soldiers carry uh, in their body. So we're looking for alternative techniques that can help these uh, soldiers. And um, we have met more than one who has benefited from this. I went to the LAVA. Um, they're doing some amazing, innovative things. Where I've met Vietnam vets who started to go through, whether it was eye rest or mindfulness or whatever, and say things like, um, I don't think about killing myself every day anymore since I've been doing this program. Or I'm off my meds, I'm sleeping through the night. And another Vietnam vet said, which was really inspirational for me, said, we have to get out and we have to tell these Iraq and Afghanistan veterans that they don't have to wait 40 years before they find something that can help them deal with what they need to deal with. So that's why I'm motivated and Scott and Annie and my staff are motivated to try to continue to get this word out because it's working. There aren't any side effects to what we're promoting, but we do have to get the word out. So I'm very thankful um, that the panel is here. Just FYI, um, we do a weekly through the Addiction Treatment and Recovery Caucus, and I'm also a co-chair, we do a weekly meditation uh, group that we've had up to 30 uh, staffers involved in and some members, and that is going to be Friday at 9.30. Canon 121. Canon 121. I'm just a mouthpiece. <laughs> <laughs> That's going on. So if you, if you wanna, try it and see what it's like. It's one thing to read about it, but to sit for 15, 20, or 30 minutes and have, it's a nice little downtime in the week as well, but see what we're doing. Um, next week, Andrew Weil will be here, um, who's a big innovative uh, healthcare specialist. He's coming to, to do one of these events for us. So anyway, let me get to um, our panel here. So first, Dr. Sonia Batten. So thank you so much, Dr. Batten. She serves in a leadership role for the Office of Mental Health Services at the VA Central Office as the Deputy Chief uh, Consultant for Specialty Mental Health. She oversees VA's collaborations with the Department of Defense on mental health issues, serves as the primary uh, liaison for VA specialized mental health centers of excellence. Um, throughout her career, Dr. Batten has developed multiple outpatient and residential treatment programs for veterans of all uh, areas of service living with post-traumatic stress. So very much we've heard rave reviews of <coughs> you, Dr. Batten. Um, 
So uh, next is uh, retired General Tom Jones with the Marine Corps, was the founding uh, commander of the Training and Education Command, uh, responsible for the Marine Corps instituting the martial arts program. And he helped the uh, Marine Corps develop operational stress control and readiness training program. Uh, he's been asked by senior Marine Corps leaders to study Liz Stanley's program, the one that I mentioned. Um, the Mine Training Institute is implementing and make recommendations on how to incorporate it into United States Marine Corps training and has become a student of her practice as well. And Frank D. Giovanni. Yes, sir. I walked up to Frank and the first thing I said is, Frank, I'm half Italian, so let's talk. <laughs> um, Frank D. Giovanni serves as the director of Training Readiness and Strategy Office of the Deputy Assistant <coughs> Secretary of Defense for Readiness. His responsibilities include policy and oversight of military training readiness and capability modernization. Mr. D. Giovanni retired from the Air Force, achieving the rank of Colonel with Senior Pilot and Navigator Aeronautical Ratings. Aircraft flown include the F-15, A-37, and B-52. Lots of mindfulness needed. Is flying those aircraft. So we can start with Dr. Beck. Sure. Thank you. I'm excited to have the opportunity to um, to speak to you all today. And what I'm going to focus on, so I'm from the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I'm going to focus on just telling you a little bit about um, what we're doing with mindfulness-based uh, treatments and interventions uh, throughout VA, and some of how we're also focusing on um, studying these interventions so we can learn more about how effective they are, for whom they're most effective, and in what sort of settings. Um, so I'll, I'll probably focus um, more on PTSD than, than anything else, but certainly we use mindfulness-based treatments for, for a variety of mental health conditions throughout VA. And, um, and really when we're talking about um, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, our philosophy is that, um, that all veterans should be offered as their, their sort of first line, first opportunity for mental health treatment. They should be offered those treatments that have the most empirical evidence behind them. So just like if you were coming to a, um, a medical center for heart disease or diabetes, you would want to receive the treatment that had the most research behind it to show that it was the most effective. And so I want to start off by just putting in context that, for example, for post-traumatic stress disorder, what the research shows us is that the most effective treatments are cognitive behavioral therapies. So those are talk therapies where individuals are encouraged to um, talk about the traumatic event that they've been through, to talk about some of the thoughts that they have about um, what it means to them that they experience that event and how it's influenced their sort of views on themselves and others in the world. And we have very effective treatments for PTSD. That said, it's important to realize that, that we want to have a range of treatments available um, because it's not one size fits all. And even with our very effective treatments for PTSD, they're not universally effective. They're not, they're not effective for everyone. Um, you know, for some clients, it's just not the right fit for them. It doesn't fit with um, their way of experiencing the world or what's most helpful for them. Um, you know, our treatments for PTSD are often exposure-based, and that means that we ask people to really talk about the specific trauma that they experienced. And while we know that that's very effective, not all clients are willing to do that, and that's, and that's okay. That's their choice. And so it's important to have alternatives um, so that people can, um, can choose what's right for them, or maybe, maybe at some point they will be willing to do that, but maybe as a first step that's not what they choose to do. Um, and we also know that for some of our um, cognitive behavioral treatments, like exposure therapy, they work more when the person's problems are um, anxiety focused. So when there's fear and anxiety, um, and then having people approach those things that make them anxious over time, what we find is that the anxiety will eventually level off. But it doesn't work the same way when we're talking about things like anger or guilt or shame. You know, we wouldn't necessarily expect sadness or guilt over losing a buddy in battles. We wouldn't necessarily expect that to ever go away, right? And so, um, so it's important to have multiple models of how we approach these things. And we really think that 
acceptance and mindfulness-based treatments allow us to build on the evidence for existing treatments that we have while providing some alternatives for people who may not be willing um, or may not have benefited from traditional treatments. And it allows us to really look at the full continuum of emotional experience, so not just anxiety and fear, but we can work on acceptance and mindfulness with the whole range of emotional experiences, um, including shame, guilt, anger, um, sadness, and those sorts of things. Um, so, so it's important just to sort of put it in that context that, um, that mindfulness and acceptance-based treatments may be a really important tool, um, and that's what I'll focus on talking about today, but it's, it's not that to the exclusion of the other things that we know are effective. Um, just to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we find in VA in terms of complementary and alternative medicine in general. A survey that we did a couple of years ago just looking at CAM, complementary and alternative medicine practices across our VA system, found that 89% of our VA medical centers were using some form of CAM treatment for, for some uh, problem that the veterans were coming to them for. And the top um, four reasons that CAM practices were being used in VA were all mental health related. So um, stress management, anxiety disorders, PTSD, and depression. So there is a strong interest in using complementary and alternative medicine practices for mental health. And in fact, we did a survey specifically of our PTSD programs to find out how much our PTSD programs were incorporating complementary and alternative medicine practices. And we found that 75% of our PTSD programs had at least some capability to provide mindfulness-based treatments. So um, this is not something that's new to VA. This is something that our clinicians are very interested in and have been receiving training in. Um, and there are a variety of mindfulness-based treatments that we use for PTSD, for depression, and, um, and uh, for you know, related mental health conditions. Um, and, and it's important to realize, though, that we don't have the strength of scientific evidence for these mindfulness-based practices. A again, as I was saying, it's sort of a first-line treatment for things like PTSD. And so um, while we are providing it to some veterans where it seems um, clinically indicated and the, and the therapist and the client together have identified that this is the treatment they want to use, um, it's important to realize that we also need to be building the scientific base so that we can understand whether or not these treatments are effective, for whom they're effective, how much we need to be providing, you know, how many um, sessions of mindfulness-based treatment do we need to be providing? Um, can we provide it via telehealth or does it have to be in person? Should it be in group format or individual format? There are all sorts of things that we think are important to study so that we can better understand how to use mindfulness-based practices to the highest benefit for our veterans. And so actually a couple of years ago, we um, issued a request for proposals through our Office of Research and Development, um, asking for proposals for meditation-based research studies for PTSD, and really looking for those high-grade, randomized controlled trials where we have a control group, and so by the end, you can say, that, that the effect that we see is because um, they receive this intervention versus this intervention. And so um, the Office of Research and Development funded three studies. Um, they were all three two-year studies, so we're about halfway through those uh, three two-year studies, each for about a million dollars. And um, two of them are looking at mindfulness-based approaches to the treatment of PTSD, and one is looking at mantra repetition, which is another um, meditation-based treatment. And, um, and so both of those are, uh, all three of those studies are in progress, um, and in a year, year and a half, we should um, have the results to share. So we're very much looking forward to um, seeing the results of those controlled studies. Um, and um, because we know that this is something that our clinicians have interest in, veterans have interest in, but we wanna make sure that, that we're supporting the scientific research base and not just going based on you know, our gut instincts that this is helpful for some people. Um, we also have a number of what we call demonstration projects or pilot projects across VA. 
And so we funded um, demonstration projects at nine VA medical centers around the country, again, about two years ago. And those are um, looking at a variety of different practices. Those are not that same sort of scientifically controlled, randomized controlled trial, but more when we <coughs> start seeing veterans in routine care, we offer them this treatment and then we're studying the outcomes and the acceptability and whether veterans like it, you know, how, both how is it um, working with respect to their clinical symptoms, but also quality of life, patient satisfaction, things like that. So we have nine of those uh, studies going on and they're looking at interventions like mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, uh, mantra repetition, transcendental meditation. Um, and again, they're looking at them in a variety of formats. So individual therapy, group therapy, through telehealth. Um, and uh, so we're really excited to be able to get some of the results of those. And we hired an, an independent academic group from the University of Rochester to do the evaluation of all of those nine demonstration projects using similar measures and similar processes so that even though they're each looking at a slightly different approach to meditation, um, we hope that we'll have similar enough uh, metrics to be able to see um, what the effect was. And so probably toward the end of the calendar year, um, we'll have something that we're able to say about how, um, how those have gone. So, but in general, it, it's been very well received by the veterans. They've really enjoyed it. We've not had trouble recruiting people. You know, people are very interested, both the clinicians and, and the veterans. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was just about two of the um, sort of uh, more standard um, psychotherapy approaches that we have in VA that we have um, been disseminating and providing training for. The largest one is called acceptance and commitment therapy. And acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, is a um, third wave behavioral treatment um, that's really focused on um, recognizing that we all have certain thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, memories, urges that come up for us throughout the day, every single day of our lives. And the extent to which we try to um, fight with those, try to control those, avoid those experiences, when that's your characteristic way of dealing with unwanted thoughts, feelings, memories, et cetera, um, it may work in the short term, but over time what the evidence shows us is that avoidance is not a terribly effective way of, of dealing with our own internal experiences. And so acceptance and commitment therapy is based on the premise that we can learn different ways to um, be in touch with those thoughts, feelings, memories. I know I sound like a shrink, but I am, so I can't help it. Um, you know, that we can learn different ways to, to be in touch with those things because if we were going to be able to get rid of them, we probably would have figured out how to do that already. So instead, maybe we can try a different approach and work on accepting and being mindful of what's there. And then at the same time, you know, it's not about just sort of touchy-feely, get in touch with your emotions and that's good enough. It's can we be present with what's there anyway in the service of being able to move forward with our lives? And so ACT is really based on this idea that we work with each individual to identify the directions, the values that are important to them in their lives. And then how can we help them move forward to live a life that's more meaningful and effective for them, even in the presence of those thoughts, feelings, memories, bodily sensations, behavioral predispositions, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's ACT, and ACT is an evidence-based treatment um, that's been researched and applied around the world and um, has been shown to be effective for a variety of uh, problems like depression, uh, chronic pain, um, smoking cessation, um, psychotic symptoms, a really wide variety of, um, of behavioral issues. And so in ACT, um, we have practitioners in uh, all across the country who are doing ACT, but we've done a targeted dissemination of training on ACT for depression. And so at this point, we've trained about 480 clinicians around the country in ACT, although there are many others who have been to trainings on their own, not, not through our dissemination. Um, they're in about 75% of our medical centers providing ACT specifically for depression. Um, but many clinicians use it with clients where, where it's an appropriate um, sort of clinical uh, intervention for other problems as well. 
And then the second one that's, a, a, again, um, probably the next most frequent treatment in our VAs that has a mindfulness component is called dialectical behavior therapy. And again, that's a behavioral therapy that was initially developed by Marshall Lenihan at the University of Washington, specifically for individuals who were at chronic high risk of self-injury. And so these are individuals who might frequently be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and frequently have a trauma history themselves. And so dialectical behavior therapy um, is again one of these acceptance and mindfulness-based treatments um, and that really specifically teaches mindfulness skills. Because for, for individuals who are at chronic risk of self-harm and high suicide risk, it's often because they sort of get into a moment and are experiencing intense emotions or really difficult thoughts and aren't able to just sit with those and have them present. And so often the self-injury is a way to get a, try to get away from that moment because they don't know what else to do. And so mindfulness can be one of those tools that we teach in order to help people get there, be present in the moment, and recognize that they can make a variety of choices in order to get through those difficult situations. So DBT is something that, again, we have um, in many of our uh, trauma recovery programs nationwide, but it's not something that we've done a national dissemination of. Um, but we're looking right now at doing some pilot projects for DBT and really looking at um, doing the, specifically the teaching the skills that are part of DBT to teams across the country and, um, and seeing whether or not uh, it's effective and how it works with our veteran population in a slightly more um, structured way. So, um, so those I think are the, the main points that I wanted to, to hit for today. And I guess we'll do questions and yeah, we'll have discussion to afterwards. Okay. So thank you. I'm standing in for Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Stanley, uh, who developed the My Fitness uh, program. In fact, um, myself and my staff actually went through all 20 hours of the training. So I'm, I'm a bureaucrat, that's what I do for a living, uh, but I also write military training policy. So I, I was very interested in this class of, of training and therefore felt that the best way to understand it was to actually participate in it. So, so me and five members of my staff went through five hours, or actually 20 hours of training over about a six week period. And, um, and I found it to be very, very fascinating and extremely useful. So I wanna talk a little bit about what I learned from that training course. Um, how many of you have actually, except for the congressman, we'll, we'll, we'll exclude you, sir, but how many of you have actually um, done some my fitness exercises and training? Good. So, and help me, sir, because I, I, I know that you uh, are definitely um, knowledgeable in this area. But I do want to kind of expose you to why um, we are considering writing some new policy, which asks the departments, the services, to look at this class of training. So, you know, as, as the Congress said, I have 26 years in the United States Air Force, and I'm sure my friend General Joe will make a comment about that. 26 years, uh, a fighter pilot, bomber pilot, um, also uh, three operational deployments. So, so I do kind of understand the kind of stress that comes from those types of activities. Why do I think it's important? I think there's a couple of things. First of all, there's a there's a there's a clip in a movie that Dr. Stanley shows, and it's a, it's it's from Saving Private Ryan. And there's a, there's a scene in there where uh, it's at the end of the day, it's dark, they're in a house, and there's a fire. And Tom Hanks's hands start shaking. And the sergeant says to him, you know, you ought to think about a different line of work. Right? Because he looked at the hands shaking as weakness. There was a problem. He wasn't handling the stress. So if you understand mind fitness training, you'd understand why his hands were shaking. How many people know why his hands were shaking? Because he was afraid? The answer is, it's a natural reaction of your body to reduce stress. So it's actually taking your body down from a very high 
alerted state and saying, I have to do something with that energy. And so it was dissipating it through a trembling of your hands. So the sergeant misinterpreted and in fact inhibited Tom, the Tom Hanks character from relieving stress because they didn't understand what was going on. And that's one of the reasons why my fitness training, mindfulness training is important because what happened in that particular case, and it happens across the department, is it was actually accelerating the um, level of stress in that individual rather than allowing it to dissipate. So this is something we need to train our people about. Um, I put it into one of the courses for, so all senior civilians going to Afghanistan go through a training course that I manage. I put every one of our civilians to this mind fitness training. <laughs> Because I think it's it helps them with stress. I mean, you have to maintain yourself in this this kind of this kind of band of allowable stress. When you talk to people who are under high stress, up so here's another example. I mean, how how much does it take for them to get angry with you? Not much. And the reason is because they're operating at this <coughs> at the very upper limit of what you can accept as being comfortable. And it just takes just a little bit to kick you over the top. So when you think about people, and, and you certainly know this as well, many people who suffer from PTS have anger issues. And a lot of it is associated with their ability not to understand the stress that they've gone under and not being able to regulate that stress, which mindfulness training allows you to do. <coughs> Even, uh, for example, Olympic shooters, when, when they get ready to go out and do what they're going to do, it's amazing, they use mindfulness techniques to focus, right? Because what it, what it does is it allows you to be in the here and now and focus on whatever the task at hand is. So, so it was interesting, I read an article about how Olympic shooters prepare themselves for competition, and almost all of them use some form of life fitness training so that when they go out and they put a round on a target, they're absolutely focused on nothing but putting a round to that target. Why are the, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why the Marines are using it, and General Jones will talk a little bit to you about that, is that if you're on patrol and your mind is daydreaming, will you see the threat coming? No. So the Marines are using it as a situational awareness capability to make sure that if you're on patrol, that you're focused on what's going on around you at that moment. And that if you find yourself wandering off, a neuroplastic rep, you force your mind to stop daydreaming and focus again on what is in, going on around you. So there's, there's a lot of reasons other than the stress piece why this is important to the military. It has to do with situational awareness, it has to do with survival, it has to do with identification of threats. Another quick story that I'll tell you is um, one of the things that Liz Stanley tells us to do is when you're uh, like, because I said, look, I don't really have time to do 50 minutes a day. You know, help me with that. And she said, well, if you're walking to a meeting, and all of us in here, I mean, all of you walk to meetings, right? And a lot of times you're stressing about the meeting. So when you get to the room, you're stressed out. She said, well, you know, one of the things you should do, and I go by D9, one of the things you should do, D9, is focus on what your feet feel like in your shoes while you're walking to your next meeting. Don't get stressed out about what you're going to say, what's going to be said to you in the meeting. And so I've done that a couple of times. It's amazing. When I get to the meeting, I'm actually relaxed. And I'm ready to do the meeting. And I'm not worried about all the stress. So try it. The next time you're walking between to, the, to a meeting, when you're walking there, just focus on what do my feet feel like in my shoes? What do my socks feel like? What do my calves feel like? That gets you back in the hair and not. You need to try it the next time. In fact, when you walk back to your offices, I encourage you to try it. Um, the other thing is, is breaking the chain on PTS. And again, General Jones will talk to you a little bit about that. But another important part of mindfulness training is, is not only being able to identify in yourself when you're stressed, but helping others to identify when they're under stress. So the other thing that Liz Daly talks about is mirroring, which means that if I have a calm, demeanor, you're going to try to mirror my attitude. You're not going to be stressed out. You're going to look at me and, and see my calm demeanor, and hopefully you're going to try to mirror what I'm doing rather than stay stressed. 
So you gotta be able to identify not only stress in yourself, but stress in others. And as a leader, you need to be able to, to, uh, to help your soldiers recover from that kind of stress level. So I think that's, I think that's uh, all I wanna say except for one other thing. And that is, I wanna tell you what I'm proposing to put in, in DOD policy. So this is a DOD instruction, Department of Defense instruction. Um, it's called Implementing DOD Training. And my office is responsible for publishing that document. It's a proposal, we'll see if it survives, but I'll read, I'll read what it says. It says, DOD components will develop and implement training with the objective of improving mental fitness, resiliency, and stress control. So we'll see, we'll see where that takes us. I, I, I think I put enough combat boots on the knee to do mindfulness training. I mean, there are things other than stress that help you be a better operational, be a better operator, and operate better in contingency. So before we get to General Jones, you, you said one phrase that maybe you could uh, just expound on for a second. You, you said neuroplastic wrap. Yes, sir. Can you explain to everyone what that, <laughs> what that means? Okay, so, so the other thing that's interesting, and I'll just throw this out too, there's actually, there's actually a commercial product out there offered by a company called Luminosity. Has anybody seen that? And it's got a little picture with a little light bulb above the person's head, and she says, I'm exercising my brain. So a neuro, now a neuroplastic rep is when, um, and it's actually, a, it's actually, I won't say it's a physical, but it's an exercise for your brain. And, and a neuroplastic rep occurs when, and I guarantee you, while I've been talking, you all have daydreamed. I, I know you have, it's, it's, it's normal human behavior. But a neuroplastic rep is when you realize that you have daydreamed, and you mentally force your mind back to focus on the here and now. And every time you do that, it's called a neuroplastic rep, and it's also helping the circuits in your brain stay wired. So the other thing that, mental fit, that mind fitness does is it, it helps with cognition. It helps to keep your mind clear. It helps you develop neural pathways that allow you to focus better. So that so that that neuroplastic rep is actually the development of a neural pathway that that unclutters your mind, which is why the luminosity people talk about neuroplastic reps and, and helping themselves think better. Thanks. I was trying to follow behind. He wanted to be in the military, but he went to the Air Force instead. I have no expertise in uh, mental health, but I've got a lot of experience dealing with uh, warriors uh, who have been struggling with mental health. Uh, how I got started this, I uh, started a camp for kids a number of years ago before I even retired from Marine Corps, uh, basically working towards uh, working with at-risk kids. Uh, since I had uh, this camp, this high adventure camp in Pennsylvania, I started doing uh, sessions, week-long sessions with warriors who were struggling with a lot of things. Uh, I guess the predominant uh, thing was uh, with mental health issues. And uh, I got pulled into the mental health arena when, when, we, uh, when I had uh, some mental health professionals, Dr. Nash, who's a renowned psychiatrist, as, who attends every one of our sessions, uh, pulled me in about uh, four years ago. In fact, the project I'm working on now has a larger portfolio than than the Marine Corps, and it's sponsored by D9's office at, uh, at the Pentagon. I've known uh, D9 for a number of years, so I went to him because I was working on some, uh, some uh, projects for the, um, the Marines and the Army for Iraq and Afghanistan. And I explained to him that, that we got a real problem now with, uh, with mental health issues. We got a real problem with the covenant of trust with clinicians and the warrior. They aren't divulging to the, to the clinician the uh, really the, the stressor that created the problem to begin with. And uh, so we so we worked on these uh, seminars relative to um, building a team concept around the warrior, so he or she would then be more apt to share with the clinician, uh, be it a psychologist or, or psychiatrist, uh, you know, the nature of their problems. <clears throat> well, when we started this project, we started looking at and his his mandate to me was look at anything and everything that represented best practices. But look through look through. I don't want you to do research. I want you to look at things from a, from a Marine's perspective of things that would in fact work. A lot of things might work in a, in a, in, in the, in a clinic, but they may not work in an organization like the, like the Army or the Marine Corps. So I spent time with 
prolonged exposure therapy with the skip rezo and virtual rack and virtual gas can, cognitive processing therapy. All of these things we started looking at. And uh, so what we're trying to do is identify those things that, that, that we thought would work well. Uh, we got into IRS about three years ago, and, and this is just anecdotal, but a lot of success, uh, not only with people with stress injuries, but people with stress already been diagnosed with PTSD. A common effect, uh, increasing their sleep habits and, and patterns and whatnot, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of progress. Um, about a year and a half ago, I first learned of, uh, of mindfulness and talking to Dunford. He, General Dunford, spent time with Liz Stanley, and uh, I started watching uh, mindfulness. I, and I spent time at the Naval Health Research Center in, in San Diego, and we started looking through a third trials, and some of their stuff is pretty compelling. And it's pretty compelling for not just for a, a clinician's perspective, but from a Marine's perspective. When you, when you realize that some of these biomarkers they're looking at have some really tangible, and as I think the research is going to prove this, is, this, this not only works uh, with um, preventing PTSD, it even helps with folks who got PTSD. But we are particularly interested in this whole issue of resiliency, the whole issue of talking about things like working memory capacity and things of that nature where an individual, if we're going to put them through, and we've done a lot of creation of stress inoculation training in the last 10 years. In fact, uh, D9 has been very responsible helping us carve that. I'm an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. My last job, I've had all trained in the Marine Corps. And we were building these stress inoculation uh, <coughs> therapies, I mean, uh, training devices and whatnot. We weren't realizing we may be eroding some of their uh, capacity for resiliency. And so one of the things that we've really picked up in the last, in, in recent months, that it looks as if this mindfulness, in fact, uh, does really impacts that in a positive sense. It has to do with the uh, autonomic ner nervous system and whatnot, and, 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 and really makes concrete impact. Um, I, I uh, realized about uh, six months ago that if, if I'm going to espouse this, if I'm going to be able to go to the Marine Corps and help them to integrate this in the Corps or the Army, then I better know more about it myself. So I, I likewise went to live standards, <coughs> and I have done. Somebody told me three years ago, hey, you're going to be a, you're going to meditate. I said, you better start using drugs. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm a high energy guy. Uh, I'm, you know, I, uh, on the go a, a lot. I don't need to meditate. I'm one of those guys in the Marine Corps. I, I can do my run each day. I can do my pull ups. I can do my sit ups. I'm good to go. Well, I'm here to tell you. I mean, I have followed the whole curriculum for Liz Stanley. It really works. And for somebody that's uh, at four and a half hours sleep, you're doing well. Uh, I have, if nothing more than the sleep patterns themselves, I'm at seven, sometimes even eight hours sleep per day. I religiously do the, 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 the work on mindfulness. I did a 30 minute when sitting in my car, just like I did before I met uh, Congressman Ryan last week. Uh, so it's all anecdotal, but I tell you, it, 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 it works. Um, I think that uh, while I, uh, I, I, uh, got, I downloaded the Congressman's book, I, I really, I, I mean, he didn't pay me to plug his book, but it's probably, probably uh, as, as well done, if not better, than all books written on, on mindfulness, especially chapters on the research and especially chapters on military and first providers. It really, it really, hits, it really hits the long ball. But I, I uh, challenged uh, Congressman Ryan last week because what he does in each of the, the, the tail end of each chapter, he said, now here's what you can do. And so I said to him, well, here's what you can do. <laughs> I said, you can go down to the Marine Corps with us, and I'm going to expose you to Marine Corps martial arts as a potential vehicle to make sure this is, this is going to be accepted by Marines. The real problem I have, the biggest worry I have, about, about mindfulness is that will it be accepted? Uh, is it going to be touchy feely in the Marine Corps, in the Marine's mind? In my view, when you start showing guys empirical data that it does help with res your respiratory, your heart rate, it does help with working memory capacity, what that means to the, to the guys and gals and how they, how they work each day, they'll, they'll get that. But still, it's going to have to be something where it's kind of integrated into the work day where the, the, because the secret, and I've experienced this myself, if you don't do it, it's not going to work. You can't read about it, you can't talk about it, you actually have to do the exercises. I do 40 or so minutes a day, and I, I myself can tell uh, the, 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 again, I girl, but I can tell the, the impact. Um, but if you don't get something in the military that will be a good vehicle for this, then it will not be accepted. 
I know that the Marine Corps martial arts has been a big, big success. Marines like belts. They like to walk around, you know, stutter stud at wearing a black belt or whatever. And if we can incorporate this, because it's a natural, we have a, we have a, we have a mod, we have a display down in the martial arts center of excellence in Quantico that says your mind is your most important weapon. Well, if that's the case, then we ought to really be, you know, integrate this into into our, our martial art program. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, my, in my perspective, I think it's uh, like a lot of people look at now. I think we've, we've scored a lot of points on on hyper-realistic training, uh, where whereby a marine will or a soldier will their first experience in Iraq or Afghanistan will somewhat replicate the last training they've done in the immersion trainer. We've got a lot of prolonged exposure therapy. We've got a lot of virtual, uh, virtual Iraq and virtual Afghanistan. I do believe uh, that I think that mindfulness will down the road will be one of the most significant things. And the paper I wrote Frank at the end of uh, this year, uh, I think it'll be probably one of the most impactful things that, that, that we do. Um, I have, like I said, I have integrated it into the We've done 37 week-long events with Wounded Warriors. Whereas uh, when we started this four years ago, we probably have one-third of the participants were, uh, were struggling with mental health issues. We're now well over two-thirds. In fact, this last class, we had 22 out of 30 that were, that were struggling with uh, mental health issues. I'm, I'm talking about people who've already been diagnosed. As you know, on the continuum, PTSD can only be diagnosed by, by a clinician. These are 22 out of 30 of our Marines still in active duty ready to depart Every veteran we're dealing with has already been diagnosed. There's no reason for them to come back to this if they're not being diagnosed with PTSD. So we've got a growing problem. <clears throat> we know that IRS works. We've seen it a common effect. It helps us to establish the team around the person, gives them a more of a feeling that the team is there for them. And so I'm, I'm here to, to just to forecast, but I think that once we in, insinuate the mindfulness into our week-long sessions, we're going to we're going to have even more victory down the road. And I do predict that uh, that uh, it will be accepted. The, the the first bit of the trial for the Marine Corps has just been concluded. They're going to do two more control trials, and I, I will be very surprised if it's uh, within a, a year or so from now, it will be a very active part of of the of the uh, of the Marine Corps. As uh, Dean Ryan and I talked last week in his office, the idea now is. How, how can we get the energy for this where we can actually we can actually integrate incorporate this across the services I think it has a lot of connotations beyond just uh, just making decisions and readiness and whatnot it has a lot of decisions relative to just how people report themselves and and uh, maybe day-to-day -day things that some of these crises we're dealing with now in the military can be if not obviated at least ameliorated and whatnot um, I, I um, am uh, I thankful for being here and uh, I I would invite anybody here, if you really want to see firsthand what warriors are going through, our next session for, for Wounded Warriors goes in the week of 7 July. Come up, uh, and uh, I'll give you a challenge. The B9's been up there twice, and uh, it's, it's really pretty impactful. But the most important thing is you're gonna, you'll, get, you'll learn firsthand some of the demons that some of these folks are, are living with, and you'll give you more of a realization of why we need to look at for all these uh, different things and how, how impactful they can be. Thank you very much. <laughs>
for children. We've been doing kind of IRS and meditations, I think, with, with kids and special high school kids. Right. But I think that uh, we, we can, I think there's a lot of you children that map. <clears throat> yeah, we're, um, we're pushing it out in, in, in education as well. We have a social emotional learning bill that we're pushing. Mm -hmm. Um, and in our district, it was one of the last few remarks we were able to get, we started a mindfulness, social emotional learning curriculum into the school districts in Youngstown and Warren City Schools. And the parents are loving it, the teachers are loving it, the school districts moving local money to ramp it up to the middle school and then into the high school. Um, there are after school programs and summer school programs. There's a, there's a magazine now, it's called Mindful, and they, every couple of months publish this magazine about secular mindfulness. And there's always an education article, there's always some about after school programs, the Holistic Life Foundation up in uh, Baltimore. Um, three kids, if you've ever seen The Wire, they're in that neighborhood uh, doing urban gardening, yoga, mindfulness. And kids who have went through the program 10 years ago are now starting to come back and teach it. So it's the same stress, and those, those kids, your brain's doing the same exact thing. It's reacting the same exact way. Your amygdala gets fired up, it cuts off your prefrontal cortex, your emotional system gets out of whack, and this all brings it back in. Same level. So I think these programs are essential for, for the education piece, the after school piece, the uh, summer school piece. And I think when you look at it, we lose 20, 30, percent of our kids that don't graduate from high school. I bet, this is not scientifically proven, but I bet if you put an fMRI on their brain, it would look very similar to a vet who has post-traumatic stress. So they can't learn because their brain's in stress and their prefrontal cortex is shut down. So Democrat, Republican, it's like, if we're gonna spend money on education, let's spend it to address the problem. And the problem is, they don't know how to calm their amygdala down. Mm -hmm. This does that very cheaply. So. Question. I have a question. My name is Daryl. I'm one of the officers of Congressman Glenn Thompson, Pennsylvania. And, and Congressman, I apologize. I'm not going to be here. You're no stuck problem. in the markup post today. It's okay. Um, but uh, I had a, had a question for the panelists, real quick. It, it, it relates to uh, to uh, you know Dr. D. D. Giovanni. You, you had talked about the need for uh, for more focus on on stress reduction and resiliency within the force. And uh, your proposal sounds like a, like a great one to, uh, to work on going forward. My question relates to, there are so many programs within the Department of Defense and VA right now. There are, are many dealing with almost every aspect of, of, of uh, treatment across the barriers. The biggest problem that I think we run into is that most soldiers and most veterans either don't know they exist or don't know how to access them. It's been, it's been the, the, the biggest problem. And with, with, uh, with new programs like Conference Soldier Fitness rolling out and Conference Airman Fitness, which are doing a lot of the same things with resiliency and stress reduction, is, is there a need for another program or should we be more focusing on you know, either consolidation and promotion of, of these and saying, hey, you know, here's where you go to get these resources instead of adding more programs or what are your thoughts yeah, on this? I, I, I will tell you that I'm, you're exactly right <laughs> and I'm not advocating a new program. What I am advocating for is an institutional approach to teaching those techniques. I will also tell you that my fitness is not a course. You can't just go to a my fitness course and then be proficient in it. It has to be, and we're learning this also on adaptability training. I actually got, went down this road because I was trying to improve the adaptability and cognition of, of, the, of, our, of our armed forces. And, and what I've learned is that this is, these kinds of skill sets are not necessarily a course. It's the way in which you, it, it's, the, it's the approach that you take, which has to be distributed and reinforced constantly across the entire learning continuum. So in, in the end, it doesn't end up being a, like, okay, go to your mind, because if that's what it is, it will fail, you're right. Go to your mind fitness course. No, it has to be integrated into everything else that we're doing, so, so it's not additive to what they're doing. It's, it's just part of what they're doing, and I, I think, General Jones, and I'll steal this thunder just for a second. And he told me, look, D9, we got so many dang programs out there. Nobody knows what to do with them. And, and, and we're throwing everything that we can at all these people, and they're all like, you know, I, I give up. I'm infotique. Stop bombarding me with new programs. So it's a very good point. I'm sensitive to it. That's why my policy wasn't specific to what they're supposed to do, I, or you know, what programs to do. Just look. 
we already teach military members how to be physically fit. It's we also need to focus on on, on mental fitness. Amen. That's all we're saying. <clears throat> and you can do you can in, you know you can do them at the same time in many cases. If you're out running, you can you can focus on your mindfulness training while you're running. I mean, most of us who do run, you kind of do some of that already. So it's just a matter of integrating it in and, and changing a little bit of the thought processes. But it's an excellent point. To piggyback on that, I'd say that you know I'm a I've studied Oscar and I've, I've studied uh, competency soldier fitness. Both of them are viewed by the warrior as, as administrative requirements as opposed to operational tools. I my, myself am a real fan of both, but neither one of them have been effective the way they should have been the way they were originally designed. And I think our what our role is going to be is is developing practices that we can integrate this into the military where it is in fact is combined with something already done. Mind fitness can do that. <coughs> Hoping you have a book signing. Amazon.com. <laughs> 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 right yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, again, Friday, 9 30, Canon 121, if you want to come and actually, who's, who's doing it this week? Hugh Bryan. Um, okay, we got some insight mindfulness. Uh, DC will be here doing a doing a guided meditation so if you want to actually see what's going on in some of these programs these are adapted to obviously deal with the military but this is the same principle too so, and uh yeah oh sorry um, i just wanted to say i'm from congresswoman napolitano's office and she's actually stepping in committee as well so she sends her apologies but wanted to thank you and the military mental caucus for hosting this and all the panel listed and your staff thank you so one quick admin note, if, if you're not already on the mental, military mental health caucus email list, if you could please stop by and just sign our, our uh, roster right out here outside the door, we'd appreciate that. Cool. Thank you so much.